Hello, hello everybody. This is Dr. Laura Davis and I'm going to do a mini lecture for you today on this book by Rodman Philbrick called Freak the Mighty. And I'm just going to be talking mainly about chapters 21 to 25, like basically the last part of the novel. Um, but I will kind of address the novel as a whole as well. Um, so just a heads up, there are some spoilers in this video. If you haven't finished reading the novel yet, you should probably read that first before you watch this. So what can I say? Fantastic book. This is such a wonderful book. Um, I think it's perfect for kids around age 10 and 11 years old. And um, as we have seen in the class so far, there is a lot in this book. Um, you can read it in terms of um, a child enjoying it and getting suspense from it and it really is kind of geared towards that um, that age group of maybe 10 to 12 years old and at the same time we can read it as adults and see all of the allusions in it the literary allusions and um, the coming of age story that it is it really is a beautiful story that we can um, we can read on um, the level of a university english class on children's literature as this one is Okay, so just um, kind of jumping into chapters 21 till the end, um, the, the, the set of notes that I provided with you for you previously on chap, um, chapters 11 to 20, that's a big chunk of the novel and a lot happens in that novel. A lot of the action um, of the novel happens at that point. And we have, in a sense, um, a kind of conclusion to a lot of that action as we approach t um, chapter 21 because already we have not only had the parts where um, Max has been kidnapped by his father who's um, you know who's out of jail um, but um, we also get the rescuing of Max um, by Kevin and lots of stuff going on there with um, Max's father trying to attempt to uh, murder Loretta um, Max finding his voice and being able to speak the fact that he saw the murder of his own mother by his father. Um, these are dark chapters and I think, um, you know, especially when we're talking about a children's book, that this this book does not shy away from that. It doesn't shy away from going into some of those very um, dark, troubling issues. And I talked before in my notes about the down under um, being, you know, at the beginning of the novel, we get the, the phrase down under being referred to as Max's bedroom, but then later um, he's brought down um, to the place where Max's father um, ties him up and tries to kill him and Loretta. But as I say, he is saved and it's a reversal of the damsel in distress, right? Because Kevin and Max joke that um, when they first find Loretta's ID, they're going to go find her and they say, well, she's a, Kevin says she, maybe she's in a, a damsel in distress that needs saving because of course they're playing the um, Knights of the Round Table and Sir Lancelot and King Arthur and they're, they're playing all those adventures so they're going to go save this damsel in distress but in a reversal of that she is actually the one that tries to save Max and she's not successful in that but she certainly tries to and then Kevin comes into the rescue with his um, intelligence. So that brings us to um, chapter 21 after Max has been rescued um, and he has found his voice and um, in a sense the, the novel could end there but it doesn't end there there's quite a bit more than happen that happens so we come to this point and Max or um, Kevin is now having his 13th birthday and um, the author is quite good at juxtaposing like really happy scenes with kind of troubling problematic scenes or dangerous and scary scenes. So we see this earlier with um, the Christmas Eve scene when um, Kevin gives Max uh, the gift. And remember part of the gift is uh, as Kevin's own dictionary. And I love this in terms of teaching kids too because it's all about words and definitions of words. And there's a lot of teaching of that through the novel. But it's a beautiful moving scene of the exchange of gifts on Christmas Eve. And yet it's followed by Max's kidnapping by his father. And we have a similar thing here in around chapter 21 when we have the scene of Kevin's 13th birthday and them eating the cake and everything's happy and, they, and Max has been rescued and his father's going to go back to jail. And 
So they are kind of celebrating the 13th birthday. And note that this is kind of a milestone birthday. This is a coming of age kind of story. He's made it to 13 and he's now a teenager and so on. So there's that celebration, but that is quickly juxtaposed, um, put next to a scene where, um, where Kevin is um, choking on the, uh, I don't know if he's choking, but he's sick. He's, he seems like he's choking on the cake. He's sick. He's brought to the hospital and um, and they have to bring an ambulance to do that. So um, his birthday does not end in a kind of happy way. And so then we get um, Kevin in the ICU and um, and Max kind of on the outside of that. And note that around this time of when Kevin is at the ICU in the hospital, Max brings us back to the ornithopter. Remember that little flying um, mechanical bird that first brings together Max and Kevin at the very beginning of the novel and Max, and Max takes it from the tree. He brings that to the hospital, outside of the hospital, and is gonna fly it up to his win to Kevin's window so Kevin can see it. And earlier I suggested that the ornithopter is a kind of metaphor for Kevin himself um, because Kevin sees himself as a kind of robot because he is augmented by these uh, parts that he has to have. Um, but, um, and because he flies on top of Max's shoulders. Now, um, in these dark scenes that kind of can, um, that continue, we lead up to, and this is where the spoiler happens, we lead up to what is gonna be Kevin's death, which is very sad. I mean, it's um, in a way shocking uh, after all this that Kevin dies at the end of this novel. Um, but he does, and it's revealed to us later that he did know all along that he wouldn't have an, his, a long life because he had researched his own disease. Um, nevertheless, he's told Kevin that he's going to get this new robot body and in a sense um, perhaps wants to believe that himself. Um, the scene where Kevin and Max see each other for the last time is a really important and significant scene because Kevin at that moment gives Max a book, but it's blank. And I love that because it's blank so that Max can write his own story. And in fact, that is the story we're reading. And that's the story that Max refers to when he gets the end, to the end of it. So in a sense, Max is like the writer of the story. He is the writer of the story. He narrates the story, but he actually situates him situates himself as the writer of the story as well. So what better way to talk about um, Max finally finding his voice, finding his agency, being able to speak for himself and act for himself um, through this coming of age novel than writing his own book, which he does at the end. And Kevin instigates that by, you know, throughout the novel, but in this moment by giving him this blank book where he can write his own um, dictionary or write his own book and his own story. It's also significant at that moment that Kevin says that he's not coming home in his present form. So the story that he's kind of telling Max is that he's, he's gonna have this surgery and that he is um, gonna be, you know, have this new kind of robotic body, but he knows that he doesn't have m much longer to live inside. And so I think that this idea of he's not coming home in his present form has a kind of double meaning because to Max, he said, oh, I'm gonna have an operation, he's gonna have this new kind of robotic body, and then he's gonna go home. But to Kevin, he's not coming home in his present form because he's gonna be a spirit. He's gonna have died and he's gonna have transformed and he will come home, whatever you, way you wanna read that, home to God or home to heaven, or perhaps home in spirit form. So um, a kind of double meaning in that sense. And we get this notion of transformation, interestingly in this book, in terms of the human body transforming into a robotic body or a cyborg in terms of Kevin, but also transforming into another world or a spirit. And we have seen that in other works of children, children's literature going right back to fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen that we've discussed. So this notion of transformation of not death, but, trans, but not dying, but transforming um, occurs in this novel. And I think at this point, we can see the ornithopter and as Kevin again, as that we can see that metaphor working again, because he's not only this robotic body who kind of flies on top of Max's shoulders like the ornithopter does, but he actually is that American flyer. Remember that word both refers to the ornithopter and the red wagon. He is the American flyer who flies. He is going up to that spirit world. He is transforming. He's an American flyer and he is the ornithopter that is keeping going to another world and he's transforming. 
So beautiful metaphor in terms of the ornithopter and the kind of robotic cyborg type body that um, that Kevin is and that he refers to himself as throughout. I also want to touch on the moment in these last few chapters when Max breaks, he becomes kicker again and he breaks through the glass door of the ICU. So um, obviously he's very upset at the death of his best friend. Um, it's like this is a rerun in a sense of the death of his mother and we know that he now that that's why he had a temper and that's why he was called kicker and acted out so much is because he actually saw his father killed his kill his own mother and he has lived through that trauma and now he is going through a death of somebody else very close to him who is kevin and so in response he also be, he becomes kicker again and he breaks at this key mo at the key moment he breaks through the glass doors of the ICU and finally he has a sit down talk with Kevin's doctor who tells him the whole truth and i love how that whole truth comes back into it because again it's this kind of um it comes full circle. We get the ornithopter at the beginning of the novel and at the end, and we get the notion of the whole truth and the unvanquished truth, as Kevin would come talk, as Kevin would say it, come back into the end. And so, Kevin's story to Max was a kind of truth, and it was kind of truth that he had to tell for Max and maybe also for himself to believe it for himself. And it is, it's not a lie, right? It is. He did transform. He transformed maybe into a spirit instead of a robot, but he transformed and he came home in a different form. Um, but um, we also get the truth from Kevin's doctor who tells Max to, um, tells him uh, about that Max knew that he wouldn't live a long life and knew that he wasn't gonna come home with this new robotic body. Um, so we get this sort of whole truth and we come full circle to the whole truth there. I also wanna suggest that the mirror, the shattering, is a kind of wake up, it's kind of an awakening for Max and we see this kind of imagery in other coming of age novels where there's a kind of awakening for um, the protagonist whether that awakening happens through a kind of baptismal imagery where you have water washing over the person or in this case it's like the glass it's almost like the breaking of a mirror we have seen mirrors in other um, children's literature stories that we've looked at um, including fairy tales mirror mirror on the wall the snow queen um, and so on um, here, the glass that he breaks is like a shattering of an image. It's a shattering of the fantasy and an entering into the reality. And that reality is the knowledge um, about Kevin and what's happened to him, but it's also um, the knowledge of himself. He's stepped into his own. He has become, he has now gained his voice. He has taken that um, blank, blank notebook that Kevin has given him and he is able to speak for himself and he has break it, broken um, the glass that was the imagery, the glass that was um, the fantasy to understand the reality of the world around him and also to know himself. Thank you so much for this um, watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed Rodman Philbrick's uh, Freak the Mighty and goodbye for now.